Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, my name is Travis Ford. I'm an adult services librarian at uh, Willoughby Public Library, and we're coming to you live from Lake County, Ohio, and somewhere near Portland. I forgot to talk about that with Willie tonight. That was Willie Vlaughton just playing playing a little, little guitar for us as, uh, as we were getting started here. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk with Willie about his new novel, The Night Always Comes. Reminded everyone you can keep up with the future between the lines talks by following Will Beast Lake Public Library on Facebook or by looking at the events calendar at we247.org. Uh, we have great events coming up with Jess Walter, uh, Paula McLean, and many more. So check out the calendar and consider registering. If you have a question during tonight's program, type it as a comment on Facebook or into the chat on Zoom, and we'll ask Will your question. Uh, born and raised in Reno, Nevada, Willie Vaughn is the author of six novels and is the founder of the bands Richmond Fontaine and the DeLines. Vaughn started writing short stories at the age of 11 after receiving his first guitar, inspired by songwriters and novelists Paul Kelly, Willie Nelson, Tom Waits, William Kennedy, Raymond Carver, and John Steinbeck. Lawton works diligently uh, to tell working class stories of his novels, his novels and songs. Two of Willie's novels, The Motel Life and Lean on Pete, have been adapted into films. His novels have been translated into 11 languages, and he teaches writing at uh, Pacific University's MFA in Writing Program. Willie, thank you so much for visiting with us tonight. Oh, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, you want... So yeah, so yeah, the, the the part where I'm like, do you want to start with a reading is always so awkward. But but do you want to start with a reading and tell, yeah, maybe man, tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, sure. I, the book's called The Night Always Comes, and it's set in Portland, Oregon. And um, I I started thinking about the book um, because of Portland's having such a just a massive boom. It's like a boom town, and I think I started thinking about the book when. I was driving around downtown Portland and I started counting cranes, meaning each crane's a new building going up. And for That's years, what Kenny does five, in the book too. Yeah, for five years or so, you just count sometimes up to 14 different cranes downtown, meaning 14 different buildings. And you'd go through different parts of Portland, different neighborhoods that within a few years were, were rapidly changing, like old mom and pop buildings being torn down, uh, you know apartment complexes being put up in their place um that you know i i work in a i have a little office in a in a part of portland called st john's and just looking out my window uh you know five different apartment buildings have gone up in the last five seven years uh uh housing prices have just gone through the roof and at the same time uh there's uh tent cities appearing all over portland homeless uh kind of semi-permanent Ten encampments, and I think it, it all started worrying me so much. Um, and Portland was becoming so unaffordable uh, for working class people. And those, you know, Portland's got literally thousands and thousands of these beautiful kind of like old craftsmen and Tudor style wood wood houses that, you know, up until well maybe 10, 15 years ago were pretty affordable to working class people, and now they're not. And so it just made me worried. And that's maybe why the, the book has such a, a worried kind of frantic, intense feel to it. Um, so it's it's about a, a mother, a 57 year old mother, her 30 year old daughter and they and the 32 year old brother and the brother is developmentally disabled. And the daughter is trying to convince the mom to buy their rental house. They get a they get a deal. The landlord's going to sell them their rental house, which they've lived in. For their for Lynette, the main character's entire life, um, and and at the last moment, her mom gets cold feet, and it's really kind of a discussion about uh, what do you do uh, during these kind of boom town gentrification sweeps, I guess, uh, that are happening all over in so many cities in the USA and worldwide. I, I was just talking to somebody in from Dublin, Ireland, and the same things going on there. Um, and so it's it's kind of an argument to try or not to try. Uh, it's kind of a discussion on is the American dream even possible uh, for a lot of people in big cities? That idea of home ownership, and um, uh, and it's you know it's kind of I was thinking about the, that idea of when you're just walking down the street, you see um, 
everybody you meet has, you know, concrete on their back a little bit. They're carrying weight. Every family has their problems and, and has their issues. And I wanted to talk about, take a working class family that had some problems. They, they're trying to care for their adult disabled, uh, you know, Lynette's brother, Kenny. Um, and at the same time, they have to figure out how to, to, to navigate a, a, a city in which housing prices have gone up, you know, almost five times in 20 years and, and wages have only gone up twice. How do they stay in their neighborhood and how do they survive? So that was my main kind of the big ideas behind the book. Um, I guess I could give a reading right now. Was that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here I go. This is just a, this is just a little section. I don't need to really set it up. It's just a, um, it's a, Lynette uh, has a a quest. Most of the novel takes place in one night when she gets really worried about money, and um, so her mom and I, her mom starts to to falter on buying a house near a freeway for two hundred eighty thousand dollars, and so Lynette, um, who has bad credit. Uh, goes out and tries to get all the money that people have owed her over the years. And, and, and here's just a, a quick scene. There was an unmarked door in the back of the Dutchman's restaurant that led to the kitchen. Lynette knocked on it until the night cleaner opened it. What do you want? Said a tall man standing in the doorway. I don't know if you recognize me, but I'm Lynette. I've worked in the bar the last few years. We've met a couple times. Well, I know who you are, he said. Why don't you go through the bar entrance? Because I want to talk to you. Me, he said. Why do you want to talk to me? Your name is Cody, right? He nodded. Why do you want to know? I just wanted to make sure I was talking to the right guy. Will you let me in? It's freezing out here and I'm getting soaked. He stepped back and let her in. Cody was six feet, three inches tall and weighed less than 140 pounds. He was so thin and gaunt that he looked ill. He had a scraggly beard and his brown hair was curly and long. There were holes in his earlobes where he'd once had piercings. His nose was narrow and long and drooped at the end, and his arms were bony and covered in new, brightly colored tattoos. He moved back into the kitchen and Lynette shut the door behind her. Fluorescent lights shone down from the ceiling in a radio plate. The kitchen smelled of bacon grease, bleach, and cigarette smoke. Cody leaned against the prep counter. What do you want with me? Well, I've heard you've been in prison. Well, I sat to you, he said, and took a pack of cigarettes from his pants pocket and lit one. You're not supposed to smoke in here. Why do you care? Lynette shrugged. Sorry, you're right. I have something to ask, but I need to know a few things first. What were you in prison for? Burglary. That's what I heard, said Lynette. What did you steal? Why do you want to know? I just want to know. A half full pot of coffee sat on a warmer. He went to it and poured some into a metal travel mug. He added five packs of sugar and stirred it with a fork. I stole a lot of things, but right now I just want to get out of here and you're getting in the way of that. So what do you want? I need to ask, I need help to do something illegal. And I didn't know who else to ask. Shirley told me you'd been in prison, so I thought of you, and I knew you were working tonight. He shook his head. The last thing I'm gonna do is anything illegal. Anyway, I don't even know you. Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay, I understand, said Lynette. I don't know that much about things like this, and it's probably a bad idea, so I'll just leave you alone. But please, don't tell anyone I came to see you, okay? She headed for the door and was nearly to it when Cody said, I ain't going to do whatever you're thinking, but what is it? She went back to him, stood less than a foot away and whispered, there's a safe I want, but I'm not strong enough to carry it out. And I don't know how to open it. You want me to help you steal a safe? His breath smelled of coffee and cigarettes and teeth that he didn't brush. He picked up a mop that was leaned against the sink, put it in the bucket and rinsed it out. He took a drink of coffee and began mopping. No way. We could take it somewhere and you could figure out how to open it. I can move it around so it's not bolted down. And it's not that heavy either. I'm just not strong enough to carry it alone. He kept mopping. 
I have the key. I have the key to the place and the owner has gone on light. Cody stopped and looked at her. Where is it? An apartment 10 minutes from here. What kind of safe? It's a century safe. I don't know what that means, but that's what it said on it. When I looked it up, it said you could buy them at Home Depot. She took the phone from her purse and showed him three pictures of it. What's inside it? I'm not sure that's a problem, but I'll give you a third of what's mine if there's money in it. Someone owes me and I don't think they'll ever pay me back. How much did they say? You, how much do they owe you? $8,000. Heck, he said, where did you get eight grand? So that's just a little section and I didn't even swear in it. So uh, I give myself a, a C minus on that reading. Good, good, good <laughs> job for not swearing. I mean, this is a public library after all. You gotta, you gotta watch the language, you know. I, I had a, I had a guy in one of these named named John McWhorter, uh, who, who's like a nonfiction writer, who uh, who wrote a book called Nine Dirty Words. And my first question to him was, and like, or it's nine nasty words. He's a linguist, and it's a book about profanity. My first question to him was, what's your what's your favorite ver word in the book? You know, just being funny. He said, you know, mf -er, but the whole thing. <laughs> like, it's the library, man. Uh, yeah, so. man, I've gotten I've gotten in trouble a lot for for uh, you know I, I I swear you know since I was a little kid you know my mom worked with all men and so she was always swearing and she would say like honey will you pass the f and ketchup like real sweetly like she just it would just roll off her tongue because she was around these kind of like real rough guys all day. And then I caught it, you know, I caught it. And I, I just, I, you know, I've, I've been good at, at not swearing at times, but it's like booze. It's hard to quit, you know. If it, if it rolls off the tongue, you know, there's something forgivable about it. I don't know. So, I don't know either. Um, so, well, that's, I, I'm glad you read that section there because one of my favorite parts of the book was the dialogue. And it's, I, I think it's kind of hard to talk about dialogue, uh, but I wanted to ask you, like, that that scene you just read right there, how does a how does a scene like that, and I, I should say too that we're a, a bunch of people coming in from this talk and watching it are like did this writing workshop. We're doing this series of workshops with Literary Cleveland called Writing the Working Class, and so and you you've got all these uh, scenes in the book with these you know working class characters talking to one another. How, how do you how do you start a scene like that? that? That's my question. I mean, does that does that start with the conflict? Does it start with a line? Does it start with? I mean, does the plot lead you there? Well, yeah. I mean, for, for in this case, I, I think the plot leads you to Cody, and 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 what I was trying to talk throughout the night. You know, I guess to preface it, um, I, I'll say. Um, you know, I was interested in this idea of, of unchecked capitalism, you know, like of unchecked greed. And I started thinking about, um, you, you know, the 2008 housing crisis and, and, and how, you know, in times of major upheaval like that, it's, it's the rich guys that, that get away with, that aren't regulated. It's the lack of regulation that let these, lets these guys run wild. And then the working class has to pick up the, the scraps and, and then and and kind of bolt these guys back together and we had to bail you know we had to bail the the rich guys out in 2008 and so i started thinking about it okay if if if, if no if regulation's bad and, and greed is good like our president said uh our past president uh trump said uh you know the point is you can't be too greedy and he was talking in business deals but it's that idea that the greed like being greedy and getting more and more is an okay sanction and, and an admirable thing in, in this United States. And so I said, okay, if that's the case, then how does that look at the very bottom? Yeah. And so, so Lynette, who represents to me community, she, she, she represents uh, that dream of home ownership, uh, that, that American ideal that's you know, slipping through so many, so many fingers in, in so many cities. Um, how, how does that look when she, she's against greed? And so Cody is just represents a, like a short-sighted kind of grifter uh, that she she kind of meets up against, and he, he can't even help himself to not do a single <laughs> crime. So 
So I thought about it in that is like, she's just tempting him and it's not a very good tempt. She, you know, he doesn't know her. Uh, he has no idea what she's about. And yet he can't, it's just that idea of making a few bucks. He can't, he can't let go of it. Um, so it started with that. And then, and I kind of knew that character. I've known guys like that guy. Um, yeah. and, and so it kind of just, it's shaped from that. Yeah, I like, how, I like how Cody goes off the rails kind of in a, a few pages after that, too. You can, you can kind of tell you've known guys like that, I guess. Well, yeah, you get that idea of um, uh, um, opportunism, you know? It's yeah. like, you know, throughout the book, it's that, that idea of opportunism, of, of just you see a weakness and you take advantage of it. And I think uh, Cody's a great example of that. And, you know, and also... Uh, you know, Lynette gets gets in bed with him too. I mean, Lynette, Lynette's desperate, and desperate people do desperate things, and she gets desperate enough to to kind of align herself with such a really sketchy bad guy. Yeah. Um, so, question for you, and I, I guess I guess uh, you may have answered it already, but did did the book start with? Uh, I mean, it started with the housing crisis, or did it did that come in editing? You know, did did was this story was it because it's just so um it's such a character driven story right i mean it's all it's all like you know it, it almost seems like it started with lynette and then and then it just seems too lucky that it was about lynette and the housing crisis at the same time but but was but did it start with the housing crisis i mean i think it it started with that of of a couple of things the Portland, and you could say this about San Francisco, Seattle, my hometown of Reno, um, that are growing, or Dublin, Ireland, really, uh, uh, that are growing so fast, and there's so much money being pumped into it, and it's changing neighborhoods, you know, if not overnight, within a year or two, um, that, that I, I it did have this kind of feel like I always equate it to like, you're still walking down the street, but all of a sudden everyone you know is driving a car and you're like, well, how did they get a car? How am I gonna get a car? How am I gonna catch up with these guys? So it, it did start with that. And then I, st I then I thought about a family. I wanted to take a, a, a working class family that, um, that was dysfunctional. Um, most people are, you know, kind of duct taping their way through things. And um, and I wanted to a family that, that had, two things. They had a reason to stick together, which is uh, Lynette and her mother stick together for Kenny. Um, and I wanted it to be a woman because I thought if Lynette was a man, he would have left, you know, he, he would have probably bailed on his family. Uh, but Lynette w wouldn't do that to her brother. Uh, so I, so that's why I set it up that way. And I, and I also wanted them to have an opportunity. Um, I wanted them to have an opportunity to see if they could take it. You know, I mean, I wanted the argument of the mom saying, why should we spend all this money on a dilapidated fallen down house that, that 15 years ago was worth a third of it. And now we're supposed to pay, you know, two thirds more for the same beat up, broken down house. So uh, it, it did start with the with the bigger themes of, of housing crisis and how to working class people navigate it. And then I brought in the, the working class family. Have you started other books with themes like that, or is this the first time? I always do, really. Uh, oh, you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I guess my first book was The Motel Life, and I was thinking, I was thinking not only about people living in motels permanently, but I was thinking about um, two brothers that were kind of spent their life kind of avoiding responsibility or didn't have the confidence to ever pull themselves out of it. I wanted to see how they would respond when they got tested. So how, you know, and that was something I struggled with at that age. And then uh, Northline was about, you know, uh, uh, weakness, how weakness affects both men and women and how they respond to being weak um, and, and, and how weakness results and revolves around racism, those ideas. And then Lean on Pete was, about horse racing, me trying to break up with horse racing. So yeah, I always kind of ride on bigger themes. Um, so something I thought about with this novel is, do you think, so for, for Lynette, the house in the novel, 
is more than just a house. It's like an avenue to right the ship, get her life together, or basically she thinks of it as a way to become a better person. Um, and, and you, I, I think you've said in other interviews, you've written, you write in the acknowledgments page here, I think you dedicate the book to the Portland that enabled a 20 something year old house painter to buy a house or something. Um, do you think that the lack of affordable housing makes it, cuts off, and do you think it's more important that it cuts off an avenue for Lynette to own a house or that it cuts off an avenue for her to become a better person? But I think a couple of things. That's interesting. Uh, um, you know, I think Lynette is driven by guilt. Um, you know, she was raised uh, to be kind of a servant to her brother. She was kind of a, uh, a guardian for her brother from like age 10. Her mom used to just leave her with her brother. And he's a, a bigger guy. Um, he's severely developmentally disabled. So he's a handful for a 10 year old kid. And I think you know, pretty much her whole life revolved around him on and off until we meet her at 30. And so I, during that time growing up, she had a few breakdowns over it. I think over a couple of things, I think she didn't ever get to be a kid and I don't think she was ever really properly loved maybe. And so when we meet her, she's had two major kind of breakdowns. She's, she's got mental issues. She's, she's, a really strong person in some regards and then mentally pretty fragile in some regards. And so I think she, she's, she's had some anger issues and she's had some major kind of breakdowns that I think she feels really guilty about. And so she's trying to save, she kind of sees the light uh, that, that her family could have. She, she sees an opportunity for them to have stability and a future. And her mom does, her mom's too beat up and worn out to see it and Lynette sees it. And so she goes for it as hard as she can for anything because she thinks she can redeem herself, but also she sees like, hey, if we wanna stay in our neighborhood, if we wanna have a future in this city where we have a little power and autonomy and we can control how much rent we pay or our mortgage, we can control it, um, then we have to buy this house. Um, so for her, that idea of, Amer of the American dream is both a redemptive kind of thing and she sees it as, is what it is, is it's an avenue for stability so they can stay in their neighborhood. So, you know, Lynette's mom, I have to admit that by the end of the book, she kind of turned me over to her way of thinking a little bit. Was that, sure. uh, was that on purpose? I guess so, I mean. But, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, when you meet somebody that's had, she, first off, the mom has made some bad decisions. She made a bad decision who she married. Um, She's not made the best decisions work-wise, but I think, but I think in general, she's tried really hard. And I, and I, I think when you, when you have little failure after little failure after little failure, and, and you start seeing the end of your life coming in, and you realize that, that you, ha you haven't had a lot of success in life, you can tend to get bitter and start looking out just for yourself and, and not look out for the greater good, you know, greater good being her family. And so I think when you meet her, she's bitter. And she's also saying like, look, what's the point of trying? There's no way we could work. Lynette and her mom could work 24 seven and barely afford uh, a house in Portland. If they worked together and didn't sleep, if they just work continuously at like low paying jobs, they could probably barely afford to pay the mortgage on a house. Um, and so the mom's saying, what's the point in trying? So don't try, just try to milk anything you can get from the government. Try to take anything you can get off your job and, and try to rip off anybody you can and just so you can get by. Um, so that's the argument. And Lynette's saying, look, you can't, you can't live like that. You can't live trying to milk off the government. You gotta, you gotta try your hardest to find your own way because that's what, how community, you know, and that's how hope and that's how survival for our family will be. And so it's it's that argument they're having. Besides, they're having an argument as a as a mother and daughter, which is brutal in itself because both the mom is exhausted from caring for a developmentally disabled son, and Lynette's tired of taking care of him. And 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 they've had really big blowouts over the, throughout their life. Lynette's tired of arguing with her mom. Wants to just get along. Kinda, but uh, or wants to get along in a different way. I like how uh, a couple times in the book they meant someone mentioned. I think the 
waitress who Lynette is talking to at the end of the book mentions Cleveland, you know, move to, <laughs> that, that, that seems to be the solution. Just, uh, and, and may, maybe it is, you know, take your, take your savings and move to Cleveland or move somewhere else, you know, get, get well, out. I mean, and, I mean, I mean that, 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 happened to, that happened to Portland because Portland, when I moved to Portland in the nineties, I moved here. Well, I was scared to move into any other big city in the West. I wanted to stay in the West, but, um, but you can move to Portland and, and you can rent a cheap house. And, you know, I was in a, I was a musician. All the houses had basements so you could practice in your basement, yeah. which was a big thing. And, um, and there were jobs and it was cheap. And then in the early two thousands, uh, guys that couldn't own restaurants in San Francisco or Los Angeles, would come up here so they could buy their own restaurant. And so, so a, a cook, like a fancy cook didn't have to, you know, work for some corporate place or, or some, uh, you know, a restaurant where, you know, it was owned by a bunch of other guys, he, he could own it himself. And so it, it just happens. I mean, Portland's a, is a tremendous city and people just kind of found out and, and they'll just, so I think like for Lynette, she, she probably can't make it here. Um, so she'll probably have gonna, to move somewhere else. She's not going to make that. I mean, she's not going to make her bakery happen or whatever in Portland, unfortunately. But you yeah, know, she you're might, correct. She might get the house, but she's not. Yeah. She's not going to get the bakery. She's not. I, and you know, I mean, it, it's a horrible thing that maybe that's the maybe that's the argument of the book. But she's. But I mean, it's a brutal thing. But maybe she can't make it the way she dream. You know, maybe she can't fulfill her dream in Portland. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I mean, I think she's dealing with that same thing uh, that I think a lot of families do is like they do get a lucky break and in, in, in being able to get this opportunity by this house. It would have been a smart move for them to do it. And I think it would have built confidence for Lynette. It would eventually her mom would have gotten on board. And um, but instead, it breaks apart the family, the family splinters uh, over it. And, uh, and Lynette has to go her own way. Um, so let's see, let's switch gears here. Um, oh, here, here's an inter here's an interesting question for you. So sure. something, something that I noticed about this book is, is that Lynette is, um, uh, obsessed with money all the time. I mean, and, you know, and she's, and she's like counting her dollars and cents. She knows exactly how much everyone owns her, how much she has in the bank. Uh, how, you know, and what she needs. Um, and I wonder, and a lot of times in books, money is kind of glossed over. It's not talked about in such such specific terms. And I wondered if you thought about that while you were writing or how, how you made that decision to be so explicit about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think she's obsessed with, you know, I mean, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, you know, Lynette, uh, has really bad credit. She was bad with credit cards. Um, when she had her first kind of big, you know, mental upheaval, she used credit cards to pay for, to get, to get, go to a therapist. Uh, so, I, you know, when you meet her, she's got bad credit. And so she needs to come up with the down payment. Her mom can get a loan. Her mom works at a jewelry, jewelry store and a grocery store. Um, and uh, so her mom can get a loan for most of it. And then, but Lynette has to come up with a big chunk of money. And she does, she comes, you'll find out in the book how she comes up with over almost $90,000. Um, and so, yeah, she's obsessed with it because it's her life goal to, to, to come up with that money. And, and it's that idea of, okay, how does a working class person come up with a, a down payment for on a, on a really expensive, really bad house? Um, like, hey, how do you come up with that money when it's difficult just to get by on, on, you know, wages for a lot of people? So I was interested in that. And she's a, she's just in that zone. She's using every opportunity she has to make money, um, even illegally. And um, and so I, I was interested in that. So, yeah, she's a, at this point in her life. That's all she cares about is getting enough money to get the house. So. I asked the guy who I had in last week. I had another like guy who wrote a working class book in last week, uh, Jacob Bronson. He he wrote a book called Abundance, which is which is a really cool book. That's also obsessed with dollars and cents. But I asked him this question. I'm going to ask it to you too because I, I think you'll answer it in a different way. But 
But do you do you think uh, do you think that Lynette was a good person? That's my. Or do you think she is a good person? Oh yeah, man. I think she's a hero. Uh, I think she's a, a kind of a ragged sort of saint, really. I mean, she's <laughs> trying her best of her ability, and she's not. You know, she's got a lot of dents and scars by age thirty. Yet she is trying the best she can to uh, uh, navigate, a, you know, this night she goes out on and, and encounters all the different kinds of greed in the city. And everybody's got more power than she does. And, and she's trying to tell them, like, look, we're short. You're being short sighted. You're being short sighted. You know, we you have to believe in community. You have to believe in home ownership because that gives people pride. And, and she's trying to edge towards that. And she's trying to make something for herself and her brother. So yeah, man, I, I love her. I mean, she's, she's definitely difficult uh, and she's ragged and, you know, uh, uh, but, but, but she's tougher than, the thing is, is she's more damaged than most people she meets in the book, but she's a lot tougher. That's, that's what I thought you would say pretty much. I, I like her too. I think she's a great character. Um, yeah. I want, I want to give you a comment from the audience. It just just because when people nice when people say nice things, uh, writers deserve to hear it. So Pat from the audience says the book was so good. The characters are so well developed. One of the best books I've read this year. So there you hey, go. Hey, nice thanks a lot, Pat. To get a compliment. <laughs> yeah, man. It's better than getting um, that sucker punch. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so I want to ask you, who do you think was like? A lot of the book is an argument between Lynette and her mom versus, you know, and, and the question is, is it, is it worth it to, you know, try and write the ship, buy this house, or is it, you know, I, I put her mom on the side of just give up and start over. Who yeah. do you think was right? I mean, it's tough. I mean, the mom is, uh, the mom has had to, to go through a lot in her life. I mean, she was started out, her husband leaves her with a developmentally disabled uh, son and then a you know two-year-old daughter. Uh, the, the wife's never done anything but waitress at that point. So she didn't have much money. And so I think she was always kind of scraping by. And then when her, when the mother's parents die, which was their stability, uh, um, you know, it's it kind of falls onto Lynette and her mother to kind of have the family survive so the mom's been through a lot and then Lynette had two major breakdowns like mental breakdowns in her life and then Lynette was not an easy person to live with um so uh, there's no good person or bad person in this yeah. book the mom's just tired she's tired and like you are when you get when you start getting physically tired and and you've had more uh, a lot more little disappointments and and little failures and not very many little wins uh you start giving up and so i think you're seeing a mom where she's physically tired you know she's out of shape she smokes too much um she eats poorly and um and she just works her job and she's got one of those jobs that you know is like 32 hours 32 hours a week 20 between 28 and 32 hours a week so it's not quite full time but a pain in the ass to uh, try to find another job with that many hours. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're in different spectrums uh, uh, at their lives where Lynette still has her ambition, Lynette's still hungry. So I like them both in different ways. You know, I, the mom, I don't agree with the mom, but I can, see, I can see it. I don't really like the mom maybe, but I can see, I can see why she is the way she is. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are like that. And I think, you know, in America, there's a lot of people like that. You know. Yeah, I, I love the uh, the scene at the end where it's it's like almost like a coda in the book where the mom's drinking gin and tonics and Lynette comes in on her and she goes into that long monologue where she's talking about I don't know everything from health insurance to the politicians and the homeless on the streets and I you know I, I was reading that and it was like. Even though, even though you're rooting for Lynette the whole book, and you're, you know, and, and the mom is kind of dashing Lynette's dreams, etc. I, I read that and I just I, I gave in. I just thought I can't help it. I like her. You know, I, I like the mom a lot. She's a great character. So, but you know, the mom's no dummy. Uh, I mean, she she's a smart woman, but she's also um, 
she makes that mistake, which is she quits trying. And if she would have yeah. sided with her daughter and they would, even if they, because they don't get along. And in, in a way, it, the whole novel is the mother basically breaking up with the daughter. Um, but if she would have been more long-term and thought of like the family over herself, they probably would have had her, they probably would have righted the ship, as you say. Um, but, but she's past that stage. So again, she's like so many working class people seem to, they shoot themselves in the foot, uh, instead of helping themselves and, and it's maddening, but I can see what, like in Lynn, Lynette's mom, Doreen, in her case, I can see why she does it, but she's still shooting herself in the foot by making this move. Yeah. I think. Um, I, I agree with you. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you a couple more questions about like working class writing. I just wanted to ask you, um, number one, do you think of yourself as, I mean, is that how you think of yourself, like representing the working class? And number two, like, are there other um, contemporaries who write in that vein that you can think of? I mean, I, you mentioned like Raymond Carver and John Steinbeck in your bio, but who's the, who's today's, you know? I mean, you're, you're having just, you're having just Walters pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, he's Walt for sure. And so are you, but who I mean, are the yeah, others? I love, <laughs> love Jess Walter. Uh, Oh, I mean, you do? I, I like him oh, too. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. Great. Yeah, he's yeah. great. Uh, I think um, for, for me, it was just uh, when I started writing or was interested in it, I, 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 and maybe it was because when I went to, you know, middle school and high school, John Steinbeck was king. Um, he was king of my school because I read all his major works by the time I was 16. And then at the same time, I'm listening to like uh, the, the clash and the jam, these kind of working class political bands. And so I did, I did kind of drink that Kool-Aid, but I also was, I also got more enjoyment reading about people that I understood. And I, when, when I started writing myself, I started thinking like, well, why can't my mom be a hero? Or why can't the, the, the woman you have a crush on at Safeway? Why can't, why can't, uh, I can't, why can't she be a hero or something? Or, you know, like everybody, you know, I was a janitor for a long time and, and I, or not a long time, a couple of years. And, uh, uh, I was like, why can't a janitor be a hero for a change? Why does it have to be like some, uh, you know, guy, Ivy league guy or a spy? Why can't the janitor be the cool guy? And, and I think it was just out of my own, my own self-hatred, you know, or my own, uh, 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 you know, like wondering why can't just a normal person be a hero for a change because I knew for a fact I wasn't going to be going to Harvard and I knew for a fact I, I was too skittish and scared to be a you know some kind of superhero spy or you know navy officer uh so I think it came from that and and then also you know just you know I grew up with a, a mom uh single mother uh, who just worked the same job for 30 years and back, you know, getting sexually harassed uh, by her men co-workers and getting paid less than her men co-workers. And, and my mom was the kind of person that every night she'd come home and tell you exactly what happened that day and who the culprits were. And so you got this, I got this edge on me about it, you know, uh, about those who had money and those who didn't, my, yeah. you know, and my dad had money, but my mom didn't have money. And so there was that, that I saw both sides like that. So I think I was just interested in, in those kind of stories. Plus, it just as a fan, I always liked reading stories uh, that were with characters that I that I understood anyway. And I didn't yeah. understand a lot of like more uh, upper, upper middle class that so many novels are. Um, I didn't understand a lot of those situations. So I, you know, again, I was as a fan, I was just trying to find stories that I understood. There's, there's like, a, there's almost like a tough noir, like, you know, like a detective novel type thing going on here. Not, not, not a detective novel, but I, I, I was just wondering also if you, if there were any like genre influences that you had or where, I mean, what, what influenced the, the kind of tightly plotted stuff where Lynette is, you know, like, I mean, I was the, like make, making a way through the night, beating people up, basically, you know, the, uh, uh, I, you're right. That's, you know, a good point. Uh, 
for this novel, I, you know, I've always been really interested in noir. Um, oh, really? I, yeah, I've always really been interested in those. Um, well, there was, a, you know, back, uh, I guess it was in the late 80s, early 90s, Black Lizard Press was a press that kind of republished all these old noir novels, uh, novels by David Goodis and Jim Thompson and Charles Williford. Um, these kind of like, I would say mentally kind of damaged guys writing about mentally damaged people in, in, a, in a, like a really dark world, but they're, they're generally working class stories. Um, like, and then and on a different level, uh, like James M. Cain, uh, Postman Always Rings Twice, that's that same era, or Horace McCoy's They Shoot Horses, don't they? That same kind of like real rough, um, mentally damaged uh, stories about mentally damaged people, but they're really tight and they're really simple and they're really page turnery. But they're, the prose I, th I always liked because it was the kind of story you could read on a bus and you wouldn't you can put it down you could read it you could work all day like i've worked at a trucking company and then i could come home and read jim thompson all night like i'd be exhausted and then i'd i, I but i could read thompson so i was interested in that and, and, and i think nowadays a uh, majority of the working class stories told are through crime you know it's the it's the crime writers that they care about social issues it's like george pelicano say He's a good example where he, you know, writes about D.C. He writes about so many like working class issues and, you know, common issues that, that most guys don't write about. Yeah, something, something interesting is that, and you probably, and I wonder if you think about this at all, but Lynette, for example, like everything she's got going on in her life, there's no way that she has the time to read a book. It's never going to happen. She's not going to read it. She's not, she's not going to read one book a year. So who, how do you write for a working class person? I mean, that, that, that's really interesting, man. You know, when I first started, I, 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 when I first started really being serious about it, I was maybe 20. Yeah. And then by the time I was 24, 25, um, you know, I, at that point I was working for a trucking company and, um, and I, I made, I wanted friends of mine, guide friends of mine that, were generally kind of rednecky dudes um, to read, and I so I so like the Motel Life. My first book was written to get working class guys to read a novel, and I don't, I don't think it's possible. I mean, I don't think any of those guys would have read it. I can't tell you how many books I gave away to working class guys that they, you know, I'd go over to their house say a month later and it wouldn't be there. I Meaning like they probably lost it on the way home from the bar or like gave put it in the goodwill pile the second they got it. You know, a lot of guys have never even read a novel um, outside yeah. of school, and they might not even read it in school. I don't have the answer um, to that. I mean, I've tried. I've really tried uh, um, to get working class guys to read, and I've, I've never had had a lot, a lot of success with it. You know. Well, maybe that's where maybe that's where the songwriting comes in. I mean, maybe yeah. Yeah, working, right, working class guys maybe won't read a book, but they'll listen to a song. And, uh, and you can get you can get them. You just got to be really you got to be books are really tricky. You know, you, you bring 10 records to some friend of yours that's not a big music fan. You can pretty easily like in a couple hours, you can find out what he likes in 10, 10 records. But with books, it's harder. It's more of a commitment. So you got to be careful on the first book you give. I'm, I, there's this, there, I got one little story about it. So I live in this little town north of Portland and um. They had a, our county had a let's get men to read thing. The library put on this big thing, man, and I loved it. It was a, a Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon, right? And I was like, that's a perfect novel to get men to read because it's number one, it's short, yeah. it's really good, it's a crime novel. It's a novel they kind of probably equate uh, older guys equate to Humphrey Bogart a little bit, but they probably haven't seen it or they saw it as kids or whatever. So I said, man, this is super exciting. And I, I, I remember telling my wife, like, I was so proud of our uh, library system. And I went down to them and I was just like, you guys, you got it going on. That, that's a perfect choice. And they were giving them away, just giving uh, uh, Maltese Falcon books away to anybody who would take them. And so I go, they had an event, two days of Dashiell Hammett, at the Maltese Falcon. One day was uh, the movie, plus a couple uh, other Dashiell Hammett inspired movies. And um, 
in the Thin Man, of course, uh, being one of them. And then they had a, a Philip Marglin, a, a local uh, crime writer who's really kind of famous in, in this area, to do a, a speech on the Maltese Falcon. And I expected, you know, at least 100 people there and maybe 50 men. And it, it was 17 old ladies, me and, and one of the ladies' husband. <laughs> All you, that you work. met the library audience. That's uh, that's how I every know. library program is, you know. So yeah, man, it broke know. my heart, man. It broke my heart, but they sure <laughs> tried. I mean, I love I love my county for it. I mean, I was so proud that that, that was the book. Uh, and and you know, I, I've done those things like in Nevada where they had uh, they they taught the motel life that way, like it was a county read. And oh, um, really? And that in that time there was more guys. It was a lot of kind of guy like kind of thirty year old guys showed up, but but I don't That's know why. Cool. But yeah. Yeah, I mean we 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 get a lot of you know we get um, the the mix of the, I mean the older female demographic is certainly there, but for when, when you try and gear it toward creative writing and stuff, then you get a mix of young creative types too, stuff like that. So. Yeah, but it is hard to get, uh, it's hard to get a, a working class guy to read a novel, that's for sure. That, that is the truth. Um, so we got a great audience question here. I'm just gonna read it. Um, uh, Jan wants to know if you're a fan of James McMurdy and what's your favorite James McMurdy novel? It's interesting. Oh, you mean L Larry McMurtry? Oh. Wait, is Willie, it says, is Willie a fan of James McMurdy and what is your favorite Larry McMurdy novel? So I think they mean Larry McMurdy, yeah. Uh, like if it's Larry McMurtry, um, uh, you know, I love his first two novels so much, man. Uh, Horseman Passed By and um, The Last Picture Show. Um, I love both those novels. I think they're they're great. I, you know, everybody loves Lonesome Dove um, and, and he's written other great books uh, but to me, my favorite, the thing I like about him the most I can get from those two novels. And, and interesting enough, I just reread uh, The Last Picture Show and reread uh, HUD, which Horseman Passed By. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've never, I, I've had like Larry McMurtry novels. I've bought them before, but for some reason, I've just never read one. Oh, just read the first two. The first two are really school. They're really, you can tell he was young and really hungry. Um, yeah, I, I love books like that because you, 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 there's no, you can definitely tell when, when writers write a book and all they're doing is writing, you know, and that's it. And they're just, they're just writing the heck out of every sentence. And yeah, the great thing when someone's writing the heck out of every sentence like that and a book, you know, and a plot comes together and stuff. But yeah, I mean, that was McMurchie. Yeah, that was when McMurchie was really hungry and was probably really ambitious, I would guess. Um, I mean, he always r writes great stories. He's a great natural storyteller. Uh, there's probably some novels he th didn't stew over as much as other novels. And I think the, the thing I like about the early ones, especially those first two, is uh, you could tell he went over every line a thousand times. Yeah, yeah felt like awesome. it. Yeah, he's great. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick him up. Yeah, you um, should. Sure. Another, so we got a couple more audience questions here. Um, was it Willie or the publisher's idea to use Todd Hiddo for the front cover? Oh, wow. You know, it was the publishers, but I was super psyched they did. I didn't think we could get him. Uh, I re you know, I'm a fan of his. I really like, I think it's the coolest cover I've ever had. Um, so I was super excited that they would even uh, let me near that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's really cool. And I think it feels like the book. So uh, it was luck. I, I, I was itching for it, but I didn't think they'd actually do it, <laughs> but they did. So they, so I'm excited. Yeah, it's great. It looks, it looks like the house. I mean, yeah, it, it, gives you, it gives you an accurate representation of what's in the book. Uh, a couple more. I'll keep reading the compliments because what the heck. Uh, love all your books, great character development, incredible dialogue. I agree. Oh, and Jan says, James McMurtry is Larry's son. So, uh, oh, she's I, talking about the the, the songwriter. Um, oh, I, I guess so. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, man, he's great. I I did a couple gigs with him years ago. Uh, oh, really? He's he's really talented, dude. Uh, I I can't think of a, a my favorite song of his off the top of my head, but but man, he's a talented guy. My brother was just talking about him the other day. Cool. Um, and 
Lisa says, please let Willie know that I liked a particular phrase he used earlier tonight, and I'm keeping it as a memorable quote. Most people are kind of duct taping their way through things. I, I don't remember you saying that, but uh, yeah, so now yeah. it's on someone's post. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I feel like for a lot of years, that's all I did is just kind of duct tape my way through life, you know. Cool. Um, let's see. So I guess I guess I'll just end up here. It's it feels like I've barely touched on the book, but uh, but what the heck? I, I think we I think we've covered. I think we've given people enough of a teaser to uh, yeah to go out and purchase it. It's a, it's a it's a you know one of the rare literary books that reads really fast and is really entertaining and and you know it's it's extreme an extremely dark book that you read the ending and you're kind of like, wait a minute, was that a happy ending? <laughs> you know, I mean, cause it's, it's almost a happy ending or there's, there's certainly that moment or, you know, the feeling that redemption is still available to Lynette and, you know, that maybe everyone will be better off or maybe everyone will be all right. So, um, I, you know, I, th I think when people, when people read a dark book, Sometimes, sometimes they're like, "Oh, it was so dark," but I don't think you'll feel that way with this one. Uh, I mean, the the thing about Lynette is uh, uh, is that that she is pretty resilient, I think, um, and I think she I think she really sees the way things play out uh, and how her her life will play out um, more clearly than say her mother does. So. So in that regard, I and I do think she's the toughest one, um, toughest person in the book. Uh, she's seen the dark side, and 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 she's she's, you know, she's been able to uh, you know pull herself up and and keep going. So I I, I think she's pretty tough. Yeah. So um, one more question. Sure. What are, what are you working on now, and what's the process of starting a new book like for you after? Or do you wait till the? Do you wait till all this stuff is over? Oh no, man! I I do the opposite. The second I turn the book in, I start something else. I, in case no one no one likes the book, I'm more that I just sent in. I always try to be in love with something else. To you know, it's just a trick to keep me going. So I'm always working on something. Um, I like writing. It's it's my favorite thing to do. Uh, uh, so I'm yeah, I'm working on one right now about a a, a house painter and. And, and it's set in the same kind of world as, as Lynette. It's, it's set in Portland. Um, it's a totally different story, a little more lighthearted. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always working on, on, on one. I, 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 I don't have a lot of confidence in general. So if I quit and start thinking too much, uh, then that's not good. So I just am always working. Yeah, good. Well, I look forward to reading that one. Maybe, maybe if, if you come to Cuyahoga or something, we can have you, we can glom onto that reading and have you in person. Oh man, I would love that. That would be really fun. All right, cool. That would be really fun. Well, Willie, thank, thank you so much for visiting with us tonight. Oh, hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the questions. And uh, I'll yeah. see you later, man. Nice meeting you, Travis. You're a cool dude. Yeah, you too, man. Thank you. <laughs>